So we'll begin with Isaiah 52, verses uh, 13 through Isaiah 53, 12, the word of the Lord. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet, he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth by oppression and judgment. He was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put to him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. He shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sins of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Aggressors. So powerful. Probably one of the most powerful scripture of, in uh, text in all of scripture. I always say this, top five of all time. This is a passage that you should write down. You should be very familiar. If you've never preached this passage in your, in your churches, um, we should. It should. Maybe even preached yearly. Uh, such a powerful passage. Um, so incredible. Okay, so let's go ahead and let us just Let's do a brief review of the previous context here, and, um, and then we'll get into the rest of the text. We'll finish it tonight. A prophetic uh, context, the subgenre is poetry. We also talked about how this is a prophecy. Yeah, so, so when, when we have a future statement and the, and the speaker is the Lord, or someone representing the Lord as a prophet or an angel, we should always under and re understand and recognize that as, as prophecy. And so here we have prophecy concerning the, uh, concerning the servant and what he will do. And we talked about how it's, it's referring to um, um, him being lifted up on the cross. And so this whole context then is not dealing with the exaltation of the Christ, we looked at that in the past in Psalm 2, but this is dealing with his exaltation in suffering and drawing all men to him. And then we talked about how 
many are astonished at how his form is disfigured. And it's in the context of sprinkling the nations or making sacrifice for the nations. And then we talked about how the shockingness is, is not right here. It's not with Israel, but it's with the Nate, which with the Kings. And we really talked about this seeing and understanding concerns the gospel message and what, what will be told of them. And, and we see that because in Isaiah six, I don't know if I mentioned here. So let's just make a note here in Isaiah six. We have a dulling of the eyes, blinding and dulling, blinding, and then also stopping of the ears. And so the contrast is, whereas in, in, the, in the prophecy of judgment, so Isaiah is being called in Isaiah 6 to prophesy judgment to the, to the, to the nation of Israel, there's a dulling, a blinding, and a stopping of the ears. Now we have the opposite. We have the seeing, the granting of seeing, the granting of understanding. And so, uh, so powerful. And get this, the one who absorbs the judgment is the servant of the Lord. That's how the salvation is given. Uh, and so let's move on now. So, so here we are. We are now on Isaiah 53. And we have, and, and so here's something to think about, okay? As, because this is poetry, because this is poetry here, because this is poetry, they're going to be using a lot of parallelism, okay? And so it actually makes sense. You're, you're like, why is there so much repetition going on here? That's the style of poetry. So Hebrew poetry uh, is, is there's a lot of parallelism going on, but it's not always identical. Sometimes it can be complementary. Sometimes it can be giving us a call. Sometimes it can, it can be giving us um, various kinds. I will be sharing a handout on, on working through the structure of uh, Hebrew poetry uh, in the near future. Okay, so we're slowly working through the method. You saw me post something last week on um, and we're just going to work through each step and I'll just, I'll just prepare a handout for each one. And so I don't have that prepared yet, but so when you're working through poetry, you don't, if you're, if you're preaching or you're teaching this, obviously, if you're teaching the content, you can, you can, you can have a point for each one, but just recognize it, that things are going to be said, said parallel. So you don't have to keep repeating yourself. If that makes sense, is that, is that making sense? The repetition is meant for emphasis. So we don't have to repeat each line. We can unpack the relationship between lines, but just recognize that we should be expecting a lot of repetition going on. And that repetition is for, for, um, for obviously for beauty, for, for it's, it's a, it's a device to, to, to draw attention. And then it's also to, to cause us to reflect upon those important truths. So here, looking here in verse 53, clearly there is parallelism going on, right? And so we have the, the relationship here between these two, um, these two passages. And so what type of sentence are these? Okay, so just looking at this passage here, what, what, can, we, what can we describe these sentences as a whole? Someone, someone give me, so we're looking at right now, we're, we're going over to here to, if you can see the far left, we're looking at types of sentence. How could we describe each one of these sentences? I heard someone say interrogatory. You, you have a question here, right? Um, so we and so I think someone mentioned it's interrogative, right? Inter interrogative. So it's, it's, dealing with, it's dealing with a question. Coming over here, I guess the one option is it's a rhetorical question, but is it a legitimate question or is it expecting a certain answer? No, it's a, like, like you said, it's rhetorical. It's something, yeah. They're just asking the question, but he knows the answer. The answer is there. <laughs> yeah. And so imagine, you know how it is with your children, right? You ask the question, like, didn't I tell you to, to, to clean your room, right? Did I not tell you to clean your room? Like, obviously you're, you're not, it's not a legitimate question. Like, did I say it or not? The, the, the question is maybe it's for sarcasm. Maybe it's for effect. 
the point is that you know the answer, right? That's what's going on here. And so look at the first question here. Who has believed what he has heard from us? What, what is the anticipated answer? One. No one, right? It's shocking. People can't believe it. Oh, my goodness. This is like a side note. The, 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 con, the audience is clearly, the audience is clearly um, my people, right? We see that later. The people of God. Think about, we're thinking about anthropology and anthropology and sin nature. The people that are receiving the atonement we're going to see later is my people. But at the same time, the rhetorical question is, um, it, it's, it's beyond even my people. It's just, and, and the implication is no one has believed because Diba up here, um, we're going to see later that kings are going, um, they're going to understand and see, okay? So it's not that at the end of the day, through the work of the spirit, people will believe uh, it is to emphasize that at, at the events of this, uh, these events transpiring, it's so shocking that no one, right? No one believes what's going to happen. And is that not the case with the crucifixion? Who stuck around and believed? <laughs> right? At, at, at the cross, when he died, it was just so shocking, uh, right? And then, and then after the cross, it, it was just beyond belief, right, of what would transpire. So, so we're not saying that no one ever believed the message. We're, we are saying that the emphasis is upon the shockingness of the, name, of, of the message and how it is that they're so shocked at, at what has happened. Um, is everyone tracking there with me? Is that making sense? Ask a follow-up question. Maybe this doesn't make sense. What about the second question? Okay. And to whom has the, the arm of the Lord been revealed? What is this expecting? What's the answer for this one? Is this not everyone? It's everyone, right? It's, so, it's everyone. So here we go. Here we go. So in the first, in the, in the first rhetorical question, it seems as if no one can believe the events that are transpiring. It's beyond belief. I was watching a, a, a show recently. I won't mention the name that, you know, there's questionable stuff in it. My wife and I, we obviously fast, fast forward it, but it is based, it's based on real events that happened recently. Just shocking, absolutely shocking. And, and, the, and the movie begins, the, the series begins with magical realism and how events are just beyond belief. And, and like the, the, they'll have a part in the movie or in the show. And you're just like, this is, this is, this is Hollywood hyperbole. And then like, they literally play live events of it transpiring from like, from like the news. And it's like, this is beyond belief. And then the narrator's like, yeah, that really happened. Like you just can't, just, it's just so, so shocking. And so in many ways, this is a, this is a parallel to what's going on. Uh, the servant of the Lord suffers immensely for, for the sake of transgressors and people just can't believe it's happening. And then the second, the second clause is the opposite. Who has God revealed this to? Everyone. <laughs> it's been revealed to everyone and yet no one believes. Um, it's, it, it is crazy. It is crazy. And so it, it does remind me of even in, in Jesus's time when he talks about it's hard, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom. And then the disciples are like, no one, is, no one can, no one can believe. And Jesus is like, with man, it's impossible, but with, but with God, all things are possible. And so I do think that this is, it's preparing for us for the shocking events that will transpire in the future. And when those events happen, people can't believe they're, they're happening. And this is maybe this is why Jesus so chastised his disciples on the Emmaus road, right? You are so hard of hearts to believe the prophets. It's like, literally, you're going to come on the scene and this is, this stuff's going to go down and, but no one's going to believe. And like, you literally, it was like self-fulfilling. <laughs> 
<laughs> they didn't believe um, until Jesus had to reveal it to them supernaturally. Uh, just so powerful. Uh, let's do. Let's go to one previous context so that you can really see what's going on here. Okay. So if we go, if we go to Isaiah forty. So this is preceding in the context. I, all right. So let's go to Isaiah forty. Uh, and so this really sets up the context to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. So look at Isaiah 41. Comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Cry to her. Her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. She has received from the Lord double for her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness. So this is public proclamation. <laughs> Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight the desert a highway. For the God, every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain shall be brought low. Look at this. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. So Isaiah 53 is just picking up this place. And yet no one sees it. No one sees it. A voice says, cry. And, and I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all its beauty is like the fl flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord shall stand forever. Go up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. <laughs> Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. See to the cities of Judah. Behold your God. Behold, the Lord comes with might. His arm rules for him. <laughs> so the arm, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Everyone, especially his people. And yet no one can believe that junk. They can't believe it. It speaks to the hardness of the heart of mankind. It speaks to the power, the, the need for a, 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 an incredible vicarious atonement because we are so evil and wicked. And so this is how, this is, this is how, this is how, this is how the song begins. Who has believed what he has heard from us? They're proclaiming it, the good news. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? It's been revealed to our all. They can't receive it. And then here we go. For he, this is referring to the servant now, the servant of the Lord, action. He grew up before him. This is a reference to the Lord Yahweh. And look at this comparison now. He grew up before the Lord with two comparisons. Number one, like a young plant, and number two, like a root out of dry ground. Where is Kea? I saw Kea come in. Kea, what is going on here? What type of imagery is this? I'm here, yes, Pastor Tim. Talk to me for a moment about this imagery, and what's going on, and your experience uh, with your farm. I guess specifically, so you have young plants, right? Talk to me what they look like, what they need. Oh, yes. Uh, well, young plants are very sensitive. Yeah. So you have to really take care of them. They need sun, rain. I mean, water. You need to water them. But in a specific amount. I mean, not just pour, pour water. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's like you're feeding a baby. Yeah. So slowly, yes, it, it's a different approach when you're approaching a bigger plant. Excellent. And 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 I have a garden too. So I really, I really <laughs> can resonate with Kea. You're always checking them. Yeah. No, this is really good. What is so shocking about this part here, Kea? Like a root out of dry ground. Dry ground. You feel even it's the dry ground, it's the root will, I mean, the, the plant is, will die. I mean, it's, it should not, it, the, the ground should be moist. Yeah. It's, there's so withering. Wither, yes. It's ugly. Yes. 
it's uh gangly it's near death right death yes actually it's a dead soil when when it's dry it's cracking up the soil is dead that's why yeah. in in farming you, we do not use uh chemical fertilizers yeah because yes it dries the ground yes dries the ground yeah and so and so this image is that the arm of the lord anyone who has worked with vegetation knows that this is just a grotesque imagery it's not something you as a farmer want to see and yet it was the lord's will for his servant to have this and so then we move from the physical imagery we move from the physical imagery to the description look at this description here he had no form or majesty no beauty and this here is this here is the purpose one purpose two he, he's not outwardly beautiful there's no majesty this is a, this is like this this kingly idea right majesty beauty you know how it is a very charismatic attractive it just draws people in right and this is the complete opposite he is no form of majesty that we should look on him no beauty that we should desire him and then look at this next level next level he was despised and rejected so this is really three his descriptions four and then this is like the this is the 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 human response he was despised and rejected by man anyone what does despised mean it's not probably where we use often what to, what does despised mean Look down. Look down. Okay, look excellent. Look down. What else? Feel contempt. Yeah, no, contempt. What else? Degrade. Degrade. Repugnance. Um, that's more for rejecting, I think. R repugnance is probably better for rejecting. Disdain. Yeah, disdain. Disrespect. Porn. Disdain. Yeah, disrespect. Scorn. Yeah, scorn. Disres uh, dis let me write this. Disrespect. Scorn. Detest. Yeah, yeah. Detest. What about think lightly of? That's a small thing, right? Oh, it's a small thing. Small value. Excellent. And so now this is crazy, okay? So we don't know at this point, the big thing that we're wrestling with is why? Why does he look like this? And because, so just imagine the irony, okay? Why does he look like this? And regardless of why he the man doesn't know the why he just rejects and doesn't value him and the craziest thing is that the ugliness of him is not because of himself but because of man do you see that so it's we're despising and rejecting him and we're not realizing that he looks like that because of us <laughs> We're going to get there in a moment, okay? But I want, I want you to see the weight of this, that he's ugly, he's, he's in a terrible situation. And so the natural human tendency is, ah, this guy is nothing. He means nothing to me. That's this despise. He means nothing to me, right? You know, you know how it is when there's a grudge in the Philippines. He means nothing to me. Get him out of my face, right? That's kind of the, the imagery that's going on here. And so... Uh, Look at this now. He is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. So the, the, the implication is you're thinking about he's this sad person. He's dealing with all these sorrows. 
And the tendency, right? Just like with Job, right? Job, it's his sin. He's suffering because of his sin. That's the sense that's happening here. And then look at this. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. So think about this for a second. So the men are hiding their faces from him. He, he is despised and we esteemed him not. And so, the, and this is, remember parallelism, okay? Parallelism, this is the, this is the same thing just said differently. So then we kind of get at, we kind of see, we're able to see what esteemed means, to think or regard. This means to think or regard. So the whole idea here is that we are completely rejecting and thinking little of him. And it's his, his, his appearance is so bad. This is not a shame. We're just, this is a shame, shame for him. You, you know how, and so the sense here is that you, you, you feel bad. You feel bad for him or sorry, but you don't want, like, you don't want to be associated. You know what I mean? It's just like, man, he's just embarrassing himself. It's so embarrassing. You know, I don't even want to, you know, his behavior is just, it's so grotesque. Get him out of the public. You know what I mean? Go put him in a corner somewhere. So the shame is not for us. We're ashamed for him. And so let's just, let's just put a marker here. So up until this point, the servant is grotesque. He's ugly. Man has rejected him. And the idea is that man is like this guy, you know, who is this joker type thing? Suffering and sorrow. Like he, his, his, his life's a wreck. But look at the hook here. Look at the hook. My goodness. Like in America, they call him loser. That's right. Yeah, he's a loser. Yeah, he's a loser. Get him out of here. He's a loser. Yep. Look at the hook, though. <laughs> Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. So this is not a man that doesn't have his life together. It's a man who's suffering and carrying the sorrows and griefs of the very people that do not value him. That's next level insane. Let's change the word from insane to, to depraved. That is the human condition. We're not self-aware to see him for who he is or who we are. We're like, we got, we got our stuff together. Look at this loser over here. And it's like, he's bearing your sorrows. He's bearing your griefs, your shame. So it's sin and it's more than sin. Okay. So this is, so let's, let's write this out and let's come back there. So I like what Paul is saying here. Let me just write this down really quick. So this is definitely fundamentally con concerning sin, sin, nature, guilt, punishment. And so this is why he's a man of sorrows and griefs, but it's more than that. This is all things related to the curse. You can clearly see the substitutionary nature that's going on here. Okay. Now let's, let, let's, let's look at a parallel passage. So everyone can see my screen right now. Everyone can see the screen. I'm, I'm scrolling right now. Everyone can see that. So let's, so let's go to, let's go to um, this passage. Now we're going to look at a parallel passage. So we're looking at Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. So look at this here. So I'm, I'm looking at this footnote here. There's a footnote in Matthew 8, 17. So if I go to Matthew 8, 17, you can see at this other place over here. Let me just pull this over here. Can everyone see? Now I'm, all, I'm at the other side now of the screen here. Matthew 8, 14 to 17. Parallel text, fulfillment text to consider. When Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever, and he touched her, 
hand and the fever left her and she rose and began to serve him. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons and he cast out spirits with a word and healed those who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken of the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. So this is beyond our sin. This is, of course, it's the sin from Adam, but it's the kingdom of darkness that is now reigning. It's our physical illnesses and sicknesses that are brought on by the curse of death from Adam, right? And so his suffering is so much beyond just on the cross. And so that's, we, we looked at the, at the confession. It talks about him suffering throughout his life and it climaxes on the cross. And so people will say, oh, so his suffering is just dealing with our sins and with the, the, the demonic, the, you know, not with our sins. They just, they want to say that it's just, the suffering is just dealing with our illnesses and he's the healer. Yes, that's true. That's part of it. Okay, but, it, but it's more fundamental than that. We're going to see it's our, it's our sins. It's a both and, not an either or, with the accent being on our sins. Coming back here. So we also can say here that there is this uh, substitutionary context. Very malakas, very strong. So then look here now. We're, we're on to... Surely, and so there is this just this massive in your face. His suffering is not for himself. His suffering is for us. But look at this here. Look at look at our response. It's so grotesque. It's so evil. So when we look at the word esteemed, we can we can we can use the word think or consider. So let's substitute consider here. Yet we considered him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. <laughs> so what's going on here is that we're, we're thinking this is, this is done by God on his account. Do you see what's going on here? We don't recognize that he's suffering for us. Is that not what happened on the cross? No one thought he was suffering for the sins of the people. They all thought he was getting his just, right? He's suffering for his sin. He blasphemed. I mean, this is so powerful, not just for the atonement, not just for our salvation, but for our sin nature. We are, we, we are not self-aware. We are blind and deaf. We don't see ourselves for who we are. The Jews couldn't see themselves for who they are. This deals with, my goodness, this deals with sin nature, internal. This deals with salvation and atonement. And this deals with the work of Christ. These are fundamental concepts. So this is a fundamental passage of scripture. And, I, and I'm more and more believing with all my heart. This was the primary text that Paul was going around and just beating people over the head with in a good way. He was beating the Jews. He was beating the Gentiles. Like this was prophesied hundreds of years. And then it literally happens just like this. And now we, we transition from from our illnesses and sorrows from a uh, hard, hard life. Look at this. And some of this could be our sin, our sinful decisions. It could also be just others, other sinful decisions, right? So a drunk driver that kills someone in a car, we experience sorrow because of his sin. The one who steals or embezzles money, or is angry and, and, and abuses or sexually abuses, we're, we're experiencing the suffering from someone else's sin, right? So it's transitioning from just general griefs and sorrows from just this sin-laced world, next level. But he was pierced 
for the object, our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities or sin. This is all law-breaking, breaking of God's commandments. No, it wasn't. He wasn't stricken for himself. He was stricken for us. Our, tra- our chastisement was upon him. So this is punishment. And all throughout Isaiah is wrath of God. God's wrath was upon him. This is, this is severe too, by the way. And look at this. Our punishment was on him. And that, and that, and so look at the purpose here. This is a purpose. That brought us peace. Come on. We're going to a passage here. The gospel, Romans. You should connect these two and you should always look at these. The words, Romans 4.23 to 5.1. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, referring to Abraham, but also for ours. It will be counted to us who believe in him who is raised from the dead, Jesus our Lord. Look at this. Who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Come on. Can I have an altar call? (laughs) Just joking. (laughs) And here we go. Look at this transition here. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's two ideas here that's going on. The justification, three ideas, the justification, the trespasses, and the peace. And the peace with God. We have peace with God. Our chastisement was on him and it brought us peace. With his wounds, we are healed. Now, let me ask the question. What type of healing is this? Maybe it's a trick question. Spiritual, spiritual healing. Spiritual healing. The reconciliation with God. So spiritual, yes. So we're in right relationship with God. So spiritual, this includes right our mind, our, our spiritual life, right? New life. But what else does it include? Does it include physical? But it's not this time. It's new. It's resurrection. It's in resurrection incorruptible. Come on. But that's physical. So you're right. I mean, you're not wrong, Paul. It's physical. We have to be thinking resurrection is physical. It's not some spiritual going to live in heaven or whatever. It's it's one day we are, we are renewed spiritually in our mind, in our conduct through the Holy Spirit. Our resurrection, Jesus ate fish, right? He's, he's forever the God-man. The, the confession says the same body. This body is going to be resurrected. Your body is going to be resurrected. Not a different body, right? Paul describes in Corinthians 15. Corinthians 15, where it's it's the seed, the seed flower transformation in, in 1 Corinthians 15. Our bodies will be transformed. It's the same body. With his wounds, we are healed. Now notice here. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna step on some toes here. Okay. I'm gonna step on some toes and you can receive it or you can consider it. Let's ask the question. I don't want I don't want you to consider other p- parts of scripture. I just want you to look at this context. The context is clear and strong. Let's look at the extent of the atonement, okay? We're we're asking so far the atonement, the extent. Who does this include for? Who is included here? So, let's think I'm going to get really pokey. Limited or unlimited? <laughs> Oh, limited. According it's to limit. to lim- limited. It's limited. It's particular. The, the we, my people, right? 
his offspring. The elect. Yeah. There's no reference to the world here. Now, let me be clear. If God had ordained this sacrifice is sufficient, if God had ordained it for the world, it's sufficient. It's, it's an eternal sacrifice. It could be for all. But in this context, it is only for his people. It is limited, Unlimit, unlimited in power, limited in scope. Do you see that? There's no limit to the effect. This is, this is unlimited efficacy. It brings people from, from an unholy, sinful state all the way. And you're going to see that later. It's right. So with his wounds, we are healed. Not potential, right? So there's, so what we're trying to say is there is, we don't want to say potential, right? Because if you say it's unlimited, you're, you're saying it's just available for all, it's available for, for all, but no one has yet to receive it. You see what I'm saying? It's just available for all, but, but it's, but it, it, it only in potential, right? Only in potential in the land, Viva. But here, the wounds heal us. There's no potential here. So this is a phenomenal truth to think about. Our justification is applied to us in time and space when we believe, okay? But in the mind of God, in the act of Christ, on the cross, we are healed. He, God is satisfied in the judicial courtroom of the judge. We are already done. We are already justified. Think about the assurance there. And then look here. Who is the one that is really wayward? <laughs> we, we are thinking it's him. We're thinking it's him. Look at this. All we like sheep. All we like sheep have gone astray. Look at our behavior. We've gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the, but the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. So in the atonement, the one, so, so this here though, if we're talking about iniquity, let's, let's look at the, let's look at the Hebrew. Let's see what the Hebrew says over here. Let's look at the Hebrew. Everyone can see my screen again, correct? I'm, I'm right now in accordance. I'm not, I'm not in the thing. Everyone can see my screen. So let's look at this uh, transgression. Could also be rebellion. Iniquity, another word for iniquity is guilt. Do you see that? Does everyone understand what's going on here? If this is guilt, okay? If this is guilt, what that means is that uh, we have to understand this in judicial context fundamentally there's a debate of how we are to fundamentally understand the atonement and here this use of the word iniquity is a judicial bubble attorney bubble he knows this this is all judicial language and and god is the judge so this is not the, our fundamental issue is not satan our fundamental issue is not just the the, the physical illnesses of, of disease or cancer our fundamental issue is us breaking the eternal law of God and having to receive the guilt. And yet in God's amazing wisdom and providence, he has laid that guilt on another for us. So coming back here, this is, uh, this here, we could just, we could refer to this as guilt. This is just the, the, um, the state of law breaking law violation the verdict, right? You are guilty declaration, right? There's the, and obviously the judge declares that, but if you're guilty, whether or not the judge, is this not true? Um, Bull, uh, attorney bull boy, whether or not the, 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 the judge, the judge declares it, you could even escape it, right? There's corruption of the law, but if someone commits the crime, they are still in a state of guilt. Diba? So it's a state. And of course there is a verdict. But it's not as if, oh, well, if the judge doesn't, you know, and that's how the criminal mind works. If there's no judgment of guilty, 
I haven't committed the crime, even though I have. It's, it's a very twisted way of thinking, uh, but it's true. And so the big idea coming along here, though, is this uh, uh, court room setting. So this is the fundamental in the gospel. How can we help people to understand the gospel? So this is when we're, we're getting now into evangelism. I would be using a lot of analogies from legal terms, from their experience in the legal system, because it's fundamentally, it's not an escape from Satan fundamentally. It's not a escape from suffering in, in diseases, in poverty. Those are all effects, but fundamentally it's an issue with the law of God. May, may I just uh, ahead, add, comment add. because yeah. you, you use, you use the legal term, uh, the, the guilt and the penalty, the same in the same in our, in human laws, whenever you commit a crime, the guilt is always there, whether you are convicted or not. But for purposes of penalty and the punishment for that crime, you have to go to court because it is the judge who will determine what is the appropriate penalty for the crime committed. That's why there's a purpose for the trial, there's a purpose for the presentation of evidence so that the judge can determine the exact and appropriate penalty. In Christ's case, everything was there given already. Everything is there. So there's no need. There's no need for an, any any other trial because it's all there. Thank you for that additional. I really appreciate that. that that's why he's here. That's why he's here. So powerful. It's really good. My goodness. So good. Maybe the, 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 the limited nature of the atonement is something new for you. Maybe the strength of this is so you haven't seen this before. And so I really want us to reflect upon these things. I don't want us to be stuck in what is, you know, what's my tradition or what is, I want us to let, let the word of God speak to you and let's not hold to our doctrine so closely because there is incredible assurance that our salvation is not from us. Our atonement is not from us and it doesn't depend upon us. All we like sheep have gone astray. And the shepherd has gone and found us and brought us back.